Welcome. You hear so much nonsense talked about the sun on YouTube and on various blogs on the internet that I thought this hiatus would be an excellent opportunity to put together a series of talks based on the three papers that I published in the Bulletins of the American Meteorological Society entitled Understanding Space Weather. Links to those papers are listed in the description box below. This is the first in that series, an introduction to the sun, where I give you some of the basic facts about the sun and outline the topics that we'll be covering in future talks. I hope you will enjoy. Perhaps it's not altogether surprising that many ancient civilizations considered the sun a god. After all, what characteristics do you want in your god? You want it to be all-powerful. You want it to protect you from the dangers of the outside world that you don't understand and cannot control. You want it to be a provider that helps you to survive. And the sun, in a strange way, ticks all of those boxes. The main advantage the sun has over most gods is that you can see it in the sky every day. That gives it an advantage over abstract gods that you might pray to, but you don't know whether they're there or even are going to respond. It's also the brightest thing in the sky, which means it's much more powerful than any moon or star god that others might come up with. In the morning, as it rises, it chases away the horrors of the night, both real and imaginary, and often the imaginary ones were much worse. So in that sense, it's a protector. As winter turns to spring, the sun rises higher in the sky, heralding the end of winter's deprivations. It provides the heat and light to grow the crops that you and your family will depend on to survive for the rest of the year. So in that sense, it's a provider. It's interesting to consider that if the ancients knew as much about the sun as we do today from our scientific research, that that might actually bolster their belief in the sun as a god rather than detract from it. Okay, well, let's talk about some sun facts. 99.85% of the total mass of the solar system resides in the sun. That puts us and the rest of the planets in the category of leftovers. Even though all that mass is in the sun, only 3% of the angular momentum, amount of spin, resides in the sun. And that's a very important clue as to how the solar system was formed. And we'll get back to that later. The sun is a million times the size of the Earth, but four times less dense, which means it's basically a large ball of gas, or to be more precise, plasma. It provides us with over 99% of our incoming energy. The bulk of the remainder energy that we get is from heat leaking out from the interior of the Earth. The core temperature of the sun is a very impressive 15 million degrees Kelvin. And the density there is 150 grams per cubic centimeter. To give you some idea of how dense that is, that's seven times more dense than gold. Yet, the core of the sun remains a fluid. The surface temperature of the sun is 5,078 degrees Kelvin. And the density there is 0 0.000004 grams per cubic centimeter, or many thousands of times less dense than the air that we are currently breathing. So that solid surface that we see when we look at the sun in the sky is an optical illusion. The surface of the sun as we see it is actually less dense than the most tenuous cloud in our atmosphere. The atmosphere of the sun is over a million degrees Kelvin, and that's another conundrum. How can the surface of the sun at just over 5,000 degrees Kelvin heat the gas above it to over a million degrees Kelvin? That was a conundrum that took many decades for solar physicists to solve. And we'll talk about that later too. That hot outer atmosphere extends many hundreds of astronomical units away from the surface of the Sun, which means all of the planets, moons, asteroids, comets, everything in the solar system is in fact orbiting in that hot outer atmosphere. And that, how does that affect us? Before I start outlining what's going to be covered in this series of talks, let's talk a little bit about the structure of the Sun. There are three primary internal layers of the sun. One is the core where the energy is generated. Above that is the radiative zone, where as you might guess, the energy is transported by radiative processes. And then the outside third of the sun is called the convective zone, where convection takes over as the primary transport mechanism. And you can see evidence of that convection on the surface of the sun, as we'll talk about later. There are four primary outer layers of the sun. There's the photosphere, that's the visible surface that we normally see. Above that is the chromosphere, a colored layer that you can often see at major eclipses of the sun. And then above that is the transition region and corona. The corona is often divided into the inner corona and outer corona. The sun is also a variable star, which a lot of people don't realize. 
But fortunately for us, it's a very weak variable star. Understanding that variation leads us into the role of magnetism on the Sun. The Sun generates a magnetic field. How does that happen and what are the effects? That leads us automatically to trying to understand the origin of sunspots and solar cycles. I'm going to divide these talks into five different sections. The first part is going to be about the basic Sun. First is how do we get the Sun? What caused the Sun to form? And we have some clues to that. Basically what the Sun is made of. The mass of the Sun which tells you how we got this type of star we've currently got and what its future is going to be. And the fact that the Sun rotates which is a clue about how the solar system was formed in general. The Sun produces a lot of energy every second. Where does it get that energy from? In the past it was postulated that it would be chemical. Others have thought it's gravitational. Current thinking is that it's nuclear. How do we know which is the right one? And how long will that fuel last? Surprisingly we find it takes a very very long time for energy to escape the Sun. Why is that the case? And what implications does that have for the energy balance of the Sun itself? What is the internal structure of the Sun? Now we've already said that there are three basic layers there, but why are those three layers the way they are? And how do we know? That gets us into the whole concept of solar rotation and magnetism. The fact that the Sun rotates produces a magnetic field. That produces sunspots and then hence solar cycles. Why is that process cyclic, for example? And how do we predict it? That's a knotty problem that we've not yet solved. In part two, we're going to deal with the sun's domain. This covers the outer atmosphere of the sun. So first of all, we're going to deal with the photosphere, then the chromosphere where the temperature of the solar atmosphere reaches its minimum, then the transition region where temperatures start to rise, and then the corona of the sun where temperatures are very, very high indeed. And we need to understand why all of that is the case. Now we've dealt a lot with longer term variations so far, but we haven't dealt with the shorter term ones from seconds to weeks. And that would include phenomena like filaments and prominences, active regions, bright points, solar flares and coronal mass ejections. There's also a feature called a coronal hole, which is the source region for the high speed solar winds. There is a stream of particles coming out from the sun at many hundreds of kilometers per second. This flows out through the solar system and starts interacting with the individual planets and interstellar space. And that defines the edge of the sun's domain, the so-called heliosphere. Now our understanding of this region has changed radically over the last few years. And I hope to bring you some of those new understandings that have been a result of new, new observations taken by various satellite instruments. In part three, we deal with the sun-earth connection. We'll start by looking at the sun's interaction with all of the planets, perhaps individually. Each planet is of different size, different distance from the Sun. Some have atmospheres, some don't. Some have magnetic fields and some don't. This makes each one of them a unique test of how the Sun interacts with the planet. When we've done that, we'll come back and look at the Earth as a particular case in detail. And the, one of the primary factors here is the Earth has two different shields against the harmful effects of the Sun. One is the magnetosphere, the magnetic field of the Earth, and the other is the Earth's atmosphere. That gets us into geomagnetic storms and aurora and what their potential effects could be. And then we deal with the very controversial subject of the sun climate connection and how various types of radiations from the sun affect the, the Earth in general and how much of that affects our weather and climate. There's electromagnetic radiation, heat and light, there's cosmic rays and solar energetic particles. And then there's magnetic fields from emitted from the sun interacting with our magnetic field. It's a very complicated system and so it's very difficult to work out. In part four, we deal with the effects of solar variation on life and society. This is a topic that's not talked enough about in my opinion. One major factor that uh, is concerned is the ability of astronauts to go and uh, explore the solar system. Trips to the moon or to Mars are vulnerable to outbursts from the sun of energetic particles and high energy radiation. Then again we have many vital satellites sitting out in space that are equally vulnerable to these sorts of bursts. What would be the economic impact if we lost some or all of those? 
We know that communications are affected by solar uh, emissions. Uh, a large flare can produce a massive amount of radio noise that blanks out all radio communications on the surface of the Earth. How bad can it get and how long can it last? We already have had examples of how the sun can affect power production and transmission with blackouts in Canada a few years ago. It also, um, not to many people's surprise, can affect transportation and navigation directly. There's been some discussion that solar activity can affect human health directly. And the big question is, how bad could it get? Say we had another Carrington event uh, in our modern space-dependent technology societies. What effects would that have on our daily lives and how long would it last? In part five, we look at doomsday scenarios. What will eventually take life away from this planet once and for all? And how long do we have before that happens? The main problem is that the sun is a star on the main sequence. And as it gets older, it evolves along the main sequence and gets hotter. So at some point, the Earth is going to become uninhabitable as a result of that. So the sun will become a fact destroyer of worlds. It will encompass Venus and Mercury uh, as it becomes a red giant. It might even reach to the orbit of the Earth. By then, we better be long gone. There's also the possibility of other suns affecting us, uh, like nearby novas or supernovas. So far, we've been very lucky with that. So we really need to look at the long game here. How long do we have on this planet before we have to start living underground or emigrating to other planets to become more habitable or to make them more habitable? As always with my videos, genuine questions are always welcome. But remember, this is not a scientific review for the scientific professional but it's cast at a popular level so I'm going to make some things appear a lot simpler than they actually are. If something interests you I suggest you go to books or online and find some reputable uh, locations to go into these subjects in more detail. If you think this is useful please pass it on to others that would be very welcome. You are welcome to subscribe as well if you wish to. But above all, question what I say, check and do your own research. You should take nothing you hear on YouTube as gospel, though I have done my best to keep the information factual and checkable here. Now, if there are subjects that I haven't got in this list of uh, videos to come and you'd like to hear me talk about them, then please make suggestions. I'll certainly consider them. So my next talk is going to be about the birth of the sun, which is a story of a war between gravity and pressure, which ends in a Mexican standoff. And that Mexican standoff is what we call the sun today. So until next time, stay safe and goodbye.